Life Inscripted with Kevin Shook. Welcome back, JD. Yeah, nice to be back. I uh, first want to wish you a happy International Coffee Day. Okay. International Sausage Day. World Vegetarian Day. It is the kickoff of Bat Appreciation Month. And it's Lincolnshire Day, CD Player Day, National Green City Day, and National Black Dog Day. That is interesting. I did not know all that. And I'm just curious, how do we get Sausage Day and Vegetarian Day at the same time? I don't know. I, it sounds <laughs> like something a state representative would do. Make up, the, <laughs> make up this list of holidays. Well, there are all kinds of interesting pieces of legislation that come come through so you never know it's that's wild it is that's wild um what's your favorite made up holiday I, made up holiday i don't know that i've got a favorite i, I just not I, like christmas or nothing but a made up holiday i honestly don't follow them too much so maybe pie day just an excuse to eat some pie mm, i forget when that is I forget when it is too. But well, of course, because sugar cream pie. Exactly. Wix. Yeah, it's right there in the district. So in Winchester, um, you're married, correct? I am. And do you celebrate National Sweetest Day? Ah, uh, she's just sweet every day. Dang, <laughs> that's that is a made up holiday too. I did not know that one. Sweetest Day. Yeah, I didn't know that one. Uh oh. I hope she doesn't listen to this. Well, I just said she was sweet every day, so <laughs> I'm covered, right? <laughs> it is wild. Um, I didn't really think about that today. <laughs> and I really didn't think about the vegetarian and the sausage day being in one day. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, I guess with me being on, they, they do say legislations like sausage being made. So, dang. <laughs> you just put a bunch of shit in a tube and wrap it up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> sell it <laughs> and repackage it and sell it. <laughs> Well, welcome back. Yeah. It's it's changed a little bit up here yeah, since you've been... improved some things on the set. Things look good yeah, in here. Yeah. Um, I feel it's like, it, it's a lot more comfortable. Yeah. A lot better conversations come out when you can look at each other. Yep. Because, you know, I think we were... Hey. Yeah, I was trying. I didn't know where to look the last time. Do I look over here at Jeff? Do I look I at know. you? Do I look at the camera? Where I'm looking? I know. So yeah, but you don't have the better. new chairs together yet. We're still, we're still in these other ones. They look comfortable, but yet we can't set them. Uh, yeah, I'll. Uh, <laughs> it's been a busy morning. That was on my list, but I, I was up at five. I actually did go to the gym. Good for you. And I say it like yeah. I've been in months. <laughs> I remembered where it was at. You know. I started sweating, so I left. <laughs> <laughs> then I had to drop the Jeep off. Yeah, it's just been a busy day yep, already. Good. Oh, finished up a, well, almost finished up. Uh, you remember the virtual tours? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm getting a lot of those for nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, uh, it's a great, so like this one I present today at 1.00. Um, well, we go through other options is for our boys and girls club mm -hmm. of Wayne County. Oh yeah. Um, it's really cool for marketing, right? Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, a really good solution is, um, being able to take it and send to donors like across the States, mm -hmm. um, that can't come visit so they can see the facilities and right. see where their money's going and everything else. So it's pretty cool. So plug that in somewhere at the oh, state yeah, house. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, th those really are great, great tools, though, where you can go and see everything in and get a, I mean, it really is, you get to see every aspect of the building without actually being there. I mean, from a real estate perspective, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's great mm -hmm. for those buyers that are, that are uh, looking at buying a house and, and, and a community they don't live in. I mean, they wouldn't have been able to do that in the past. They'd buy inside right. unseen, really don't know what they're getting. At least now they have kind of an idea and then right. yeah, all kinds of uses for that. We've. We've done, we started with real estate industry, mm -hmm. but then, you know, we have one live at Randolph County Tourism yep. for tourism purposes, which is super cool because you can literally like thumb your way through, click on a restaurant, order pizza, thumb your way through, click on the hotel, book a room, mm -hmm. you know, and then we have some in adult education, our yep. Ivy Tech out here, um, COVID came along, that bad mm -hmm. C word, and, um, you know, students couldn't visit the campus, so then they took the campus to them. Yep. Um, through a virtual tour. You could get on the Oculus, see the campus, ask questions. You can ask questions in the virtual tour, like a Zoom integrated with the tour itself. Yep. Uh, so um, 
I've talked to Jeff about that, about doing yep. a tour of the state house. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Because you could literally use this for field trip purposes. Mm-hmm. E field trip, you know, everything's E nowadays. (laughs) Well, and when you look at for some schools, you're looking at two and a half, three hours to get all the way to the state house from the far corner of the state. So by the time they get down there and then drive back, they don't have hardly any time there. So, and and we do live stream all of our all of our days of session so they can follow those in the classroom and so yeah they could do the virtual tour and we could integrate a stream inside the tour yeah where they can go into the room and pop. Yep, absolutely. We'll talk about that. Yeah, that's crazy. Yep. And I seen one that was really neat. Uh, actually, I was staying in D.C. for some meetings this summer. And, uh, and you may have done this with some of the hotels that you work with, too, where um, there was a little uh, area to go by the riverfront where they had a bunch of restaurants and shops and things. Mm-hmm. Um, there, It really wasn't clear on how to get down there, though, based on how it was laid out. So that when you turned on the TV in the hotel room, what it would do is – it would that first screen, the welcome screen, it would show a virtual tour of how to walk from the basically a map and it would guide you down to where all the entertainment was. Nice. And there was then the next thing that would flip through, it would walk you to the uh, to the National Mall and to other areas as well in DC. Wow. And it and it'd show you like what bus lines to get on, what mm-hmm. uh, um, subways to get on to get to where you want to go. So it was kind of neat that's how they awesome. utilize that. That's that's on the super super small scale, right? Same theory, same thing. yeah. Um, and that's why I told Cheryl, uh, you know, that kiosk is really nice mm-hmm. at the hotel, and then people come in from outside of the county, outside mm-hmm. of the state. They stay at the hotel. They can get on that kiosk and see where to eat, see what parks, yep. where these parks are. See, um, you know, you can go to the uh, racetrack, buy tickets, all right yep. there on that. Right, exactly. So um, what's cool is I can tap in and always update all of that in real time um, as businesses open, close, uh, things update. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's huge. And, and what's great is uh, with technology all evolving quicker than we can even, like, our phones. Man, do you remember, like, when we had a flip phone? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Right. So could you even imagine wearing glasses that gets your text messages mm-hmm. and your watch your YouTube and everything inside glasses when we had those flip yeah. phones? Well, I remember the, the Google Glass that was yeah. supposed to be the first one, which I think they were just ahead yeah. of their time. If they had came out a little bit later, they, they probably would have been okay. But I know. And, and now, so um, Meta dropped the Ray-Bans, and now they have another pair that they um, just dropped – Last week, and I think they're called Orion's, but I'm not sure. Um, they're getting a little more stylish, mm-hmm. you know. So, I, well, obviously, I wear some silly glasses, but uh, so I could just it don't matter what glasses I have on, but um, where it, it's augmented reality, mm-hmm. so text messages, phone calls. Yeah. Are, so, our phone is going to be put in a drawer along with that pager that we used mm-hmm. to carry. You, did you ever have one? I never had a pager. Never had a beaver, never had man. A you weren't cool, were you? Uh, <laughs> or, or you weren't selling drugs. <laughs> Actually, I think the pagers might have been a little uh, little before my time. <laughs> How old are you? I'm 33. Dang, bro. I'm 39. So, yeah, I'd, I think I just You're barely You're state representative, and I can't spell representative. <laughs> <laughs> man. I need to get with it. I need to do something productive. So, educate me then. So, you are Indiana State representative. I say it like that because you ever make them phone calls and they're automated and you're just screaming, representative. You're trying to oh, get to the, the Yeah, trying to get to that customer. Representative. But, so, you're District 33, Correct. which is Randolph J. Delaware. Blackford. Blackford. And a little part of Henry. Henry. D- or Newcastle? Or just no, okay. just uh, Stony Creek Township. So I've got one township. It's um, and the only reason I really have that township, it's it was to keep all of Union School Corporation together. Uh huh. And uh, and just needed a few extra in the population. So okay. So that was kind of the natural fit to keep that community of interest together and keep really schools together. So yeah. Are you all of Blackford? Blackford Randolph complete. I've got two thirds J and a little over a third of Delaware land area was. Do you know a really fun fact about Blackford? What's that? They had a, uh, probably one of the only drive-in adult movie theaters. Not theaters, but drive-ins. Really? I had mm-hmm. no clue. Look it up. 
Huh. Well, don't look it up. Yeah. You don't want, <laughs> no. you don't want that don't on your search history. Yeah. I'll look it up for you. My, my <laughs> stuff's already. <laughs> and then I'll show you later on. But uh, that had to have been years ago because I. Oh, uh, yeah. In our six years uh, difference, <laughs> it was in that six years. Yeah, it was years ago. Huh. Years ago. Yeah, now, you know, that would be shut down real quick. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we wouldn't allow that. What towns are in Blackford? Is it uh, Hartford it, City, Dunkirk? Montpelier? Dunkirk's uh, not in Blackford. It's well, I guess actually there is two streets in Dunkirk and Blackford. The rest of it's in Jay, and actually a little bits in uh, Delaware County. So it's right on the corner. Are you serious? Yeah, it's it's right on the corner of uh, Jay, Blackford, and Delaware. Three counties. Yeah. So that actually, go into Jay, or that go into Dunkirk. That go into Dunkirk. Yeah. So how? So I represent all of Dunkirk. Okay. Um, so, so really before redistricting, I technically had a sliver of Blackford County because I had two, cause I had all of Dunkirk. Mm-hmm. So those two streets was in, that was in Blackford County, the right. shady, they call it the shady side of Dunkirk cause <laughs> shady street North. <laughs> and, uh, so, so yeah, there's, there's whole six voters in Blackford County that I had Dang. before redistricting. But then once we did redistricting, I picked up all of Blackford County. So, uh, yeah, so I like to say my first election in 2018, mm-hmm. my very first election, my first primary, I had 100% of the vote in Blackford County. <laughs> it was six voters, but I had 100% because I actually went and knocked on their doors. <laughs> you could actually take all of them out to eat. <laughs> so how would, like, government services work, county services, ambulances, that type of stuff work? One town would see, like, three different services or? No, I mean, because they're going to be – it's both Jay and Blackford are utilize IU health for their services. So it's, oh, yeah. it's going to be the same um, regardless there in Delaware. IU health is heavy too. So, mm-hmm. um, but, but yeah, I mean, there is some overlap. I mean, a lot of it is when you've got those small rural communities, you know how it is. It, it's EMS personnel. Right. They're, they're going to assist out wherever is needed and bounce right. back and forth. So, I mean, you know that better than better than anybody. <laughs> I know. I I can't get out of it. Yeah. Like I, I left um, my last paramedic job mm-hmm. probably five months ago, just because the you know all of this is just taken off. I stay sober, and business goes like this. Yep. So uh, <laughs> there. So let's go. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, right. Uh, um, but then like Saturday, I am I'm at home. Mm-hmm. And uh, I still have a, like a little scanner or whatever. And neighbors in cardiac arrest across the street. Mm-hmm. Run over there and start pumping on his chest. All right. <laughs> like, so I was like, I think it's always going to be with me. Yep. I, I, well, it's in your blood. I mean, it's, it's yeah, just that sense of service. It is. And, and I really I really appreciate all you've done for the community. It's, it's I, I like it. And what's fun is, you know, I started in Randolph County. Mm-hmm. You know, in 2005. My very first, I remember my very first run mm-hmm. being released, cardiac arrest on a moped. Yep. <laughs> All right. This is a dumpster it's, fire yeah, already. It hits Great. you all at once, doesn't right. it? Yeah, because yeah, you're like, well, did did he code and then wreck or did he wreck and then code because he wrecked? Yeah. Is it trauma? Is it medical? Yeah. It's wild, man. Yeah. I love it. But so I'm pretty passionate about that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, so you the, have, the, the, sure. You said, you said the sober, is that the 500 days sober? Is that what that, that stands for? Yeah. Or is that something else? Nope. That's, that's 500. So congratulations. Sober, so I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, five, I guess I'm five fifty one. Yeah. I yeah. Look Cause at that's eight, 10, 20. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of cool. Cause the 500th day, um, I was in LA mm-hmm. for VCon. So Gary Vaynerchuk, the major mm-hmm. social media influ- influencer, marketer, serial entrepreneur, all that mm-hmm. good stuff. Um, then my cat after him, mm-hmm. <laughs> that guy. So, um, last year he had VCon in Luke at Lucas oil in Indianapolis. Right. And mm-hmm. what he, what he does is he brings in a whole smorgasbord of businessmen, business women, athletes, pop culture, artists, musicians, just all of these like very inspirational and influential people. Um, I think, so I, last year, uh, Drew Barrymore was there hmm. and then uh, a rapper named Young Gravy. That was like really cool. Um, and oh, I butcher her name every time, Bazoma St. John. So she was the chief marketing officer at Netflix. She was there. So you meet all yeah. these people, and what they do is they do all these. John Taffer, Bar Rescue. Have you? 
I'm not sure. You never watched that show? I watch Apple. Oh man, this guy's wild. But um, I'm not very cultured. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. You're gonna. We can get this between this and our next stop if on your way out of town, uh, Roscoe's. We'll get you cultured. But um, just real inspirational, mm-hmm. influential people um, that really put a twist on everything mm-hmm. I'm doing. Okay. Um, and I do a lot of my stuff based on that, you right. know. And uh, so Gary, he owns a mark one. He owns the largest independent marketing agencies, mm-hmm. um, Vayner Media. And uh, some of his clients are like Starry, which was Sprite or Seven Up or something. <clears throat> and um, you know he's about to buy the Jets. Like he's right, right. And he's always going, man. And um, so then I went to L.A. this year to see it. Uh, that's just second time I ever flew commercial. Never been to L.A. Never been to California. It was just like only second time flying commercial. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Unless you want to count layovers for my first yeah. time, but uh, yeah. So I just hop on a plane. Me and my carry on. I didn't take another thing yeah. bag. Yeah, and never take never take more than a carry on. You don't no, lose a bag. No, especially with cameras and stuff in it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just by myself, man, just roll. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, but uh, yeah. So the five hundred day, I was was day one of Vcon. Yeah, uh, which God. that just lined up. That was just really, it's really weird how stars align, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but yeah, and then I think Friday, so I have another podcast Friday with the Stearns. Okay. And that's a really yeah. cool story you'll have to listen to because that was based on she sent the wrong number, a prayer, mm-hmm. um, and then... It ended up being this guy like four states away and he just bought that phone like 30 minutes prior and he got that on his phone. He ended up calling her. They talked. She's like, he sounds cute and all that. So they've been on the Today Show and all of this stuff talking about this story and they have like six kids, I believe now. And she's a big time influencer on Instagram Mm -hmm. and, um, just a really sweet, kind family. They're all gone. I told them to bring all the kids and everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, it'll be a fun one. I'll have to listen to that. that that'll be interesting. Just re- really good, inspirational, positive stories, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but then I think I'm going to some 555 thing mm-hmm. for my 555th oh, day. Nice. But, okay, so you got papers. I do. I'm excited. So. What I read on this is a property tax repeal and replacement plan by state representative J.D. Prescott. Yep. Yes, sir. So, so as you know, property taxes have been kind of the number one topic uh, facing the general assembly going into the next session with assessments going up, tax bills uh, being higher for families. And um, before we kind of get into the details on this, you know, the biggest, uh, I guess problem that I have with property tax, I think it's the most unfair tax that's out there. Honestly, we you, in uh, DC, we're talking about the, the Democrats are talking about putting a tax on unre- unrealized gains. Well, if you really think about it, we have a tax on unrealized gains. It's property taxes. Well, what would you consider unrealized gains? So, so what I mean by that is you buy property 30 years ago, mm-hmm. you've it's gained in value but you haven't realized that gain. You haven't sold it. You haven't actually collected that gain, Mm -hmm. but yet you're paying an increase. You're paying based on your assessment, which has gone up every year. So you're paying taxes based on the gains that you haven't realized. You haven't actually captured that gains. So when, what they're talking about in DC is it's different. They're talking about it with stocks, but it's really the same thing with property taxes. You're, you're, you're talking about paying taxes on the, on the assessment, which would be the gain. So, so that's one reason I don't like property tax. The other thing too, anytime we change with pro- property taxes, uh, anytime we do any type of assessment or any, or I'm sorry, any type of deductions or uh, abatements, what we're doing is we're pulling from the tax base. We're shrinking that tax base, and those that remain paying property taxes pay a larger share of the tax burden year over year. So we just keep shifting that tax burden from mm-hmm. one group of individuals to another. Anytime we type, anytime we. Uh, try to do a fix. So a lot of the discussion that you're hearing from the governor's candidates, from others around the state is, is relief for homeowners, which I think that's important. We need to have relief for homeowners, but there's more than just homeowners that pay property tax right here in this commercial building. It's a, it'd be taxed to a 3% tax rate versus the 1% tax cap. Then you've got the 2%, your rentals, your 
your agriculture okay. ground. So what happens is if we, we provide relief for homeowners, most of that uh, relief, those dollars and savings for homeowners get shifted to, to the 2 percent and the 3 percent brackets, which end up causing them to pay more. Uh, plus your higher value homeowners that aren't all, that, that may not be against the cap, they're going to pick up more of the tax burden as well. So, so we really we're really not shrinking government, or mm-hmm. there might be some decreases, but it, it's minimal. Really, all we're doing is shifting that tax burden, and and we just keep putting a band aid on the problem and kicking it down down the road a few more years, and then next thing you know, there's going to be people are going to be complaining about property taxes again because they continue to go up. We'll put another band aid on. Right. So I think the system is broken. So I think it's time to to eliminate the system. Let's let, and replace it with a different funding mechanism because we have to fund local units of government. We have to pay for roads, bridges, EMS, police, obviously. So um, what I'm proposing is to completely repeal property taxes, get rid of all TIF districts, get rid of the assessor's office in all 92 counties, including township assessors for those counties that still have township assessors. It would eliminate half, half of DLGF, Department of Local Government Financing, at the state level. And... Um, and then it would get rid of referendums as well. Uh, any school referendums, that those would go away too because they're based on the property tax structure. And the way I would replace that would be a 7% sales tax on services. So think like you go and get, get your oil changed in your car. Mm-hmm. Under current law, you're paying sales tax on the oil and the filter. You're not paying any sales tax on the labor. Right. So what I'm doing would be adding sales tax on the labor. Uh, so in fiscal year 2026, we're, if we don't change any laws, we're looking at collecting um, $10.6 billion worth of property tax revenue statewide that'll go to all local units of government. None of that goes to the state. It all goes to local units of government. And uh, if with the plan that I'm working on, if we would implement the 7% sales tax on services, any industry that's already sales tax exempt would remain sales tax exempt. And then I would also exempt medical services because we're also trying to get medical costs down as well. So you don't want to add add the 7% to, to the medical. Uh, so exempt all medical services, including nursing home, assisted living, and then also education. Most education would already be sales tax exempt because most is nonprofit. Mm-hmm. But so it'd just be adding, making sure that uh, private um, universities are on the same, that way they're on a level playing field with with the uh, nonprofit universities as well as public universities. So by doing that, we would generate between 12 and $15 billion worth of revenue in fiscal year 26 is what is what would be projected. So obviously that's more than property taxes. So, revenue. okay, so Nick's property taxes add that 7% services mm-hmm. with exemptions and we're on top? We, we are. We'd actually bring in more revenue, which I'm not wanting to grow government either. Right, so, right. So, let's, so the reason that I want to grow, uh, um, collect more in those first couple of years uh, is we need to build up a healthy surplus in that account. So we collect property taxes in the rear. So, so right now, this year, we're paying the 2024 payable. It's really your taxes from 23. You pay, you pay property taxes a year behind. Right. And with this, you're paying it a year in advance, or you're paying it basically as you go, not not necessarily in advance. You got so you, we're going to start collecting in. If this would pass in 25, we mm-hmm. would start collecting on July 1st of 26. So you'd be collect for six months, but then payments would not start building out of that fund until January. So you'd have six months basically runway ahead of time. You'd still be local units of government would be operating on property taxes still in 26. Um, but then going forward, it'd be on the sales tax. So once you created a healthy surplus in that account, then I would drop the rate a quarter percent at a time until you hit equilibrium of what you need to actually fund local units government. And I also think you're going to see tremendous economic growth come into our state. So you drop the rate of that, that 7% that 7%, sales on yeah. services. Yep. A quarter percent at a time once, once certain economic thresholds are met, um, and, and we'd allow government to grow at the rate of inflation. Okay. So going forward, that way you're still having more, more funds for, for uh, local units of government is, is obviously inflation and everything else, all the different factors that go in year over year. And, and the distribution's key on this. So that, that's where a lot of the focus, I think, is going to be during the discussion. Mm-hmm. Roughly 40% of your property tax dollars statewide goes to schools for their operation funding, to, for their building maintenance. Uh, so... 
I take 40% of the revenue generated on sales tax on services, put into a school's operation fund. Those dollars would follow the student, just like what we do on the education fund. So that's pretty simple. That's an easy formula to work out. On cities and, uh, and on counties, it'd be two different buckets, but it'd be a similar formula for each. I'm looking at uh, a combination of miles of roadway and population. That way you get into a fair funding uh, distri- distribution between a rural county and an urban county. That way um, you, you've got some, some parity there. I'm still working out the details on that formula, but a uh, legislative services agency is working with me on that, and I'll be putting out a county-by-county, a city-by-city county, city by city breakdown on a school run report on exactly how this bill, if it was if it was to go through, what that would look like from a funding perspective from each local unit of government. Um, and, and one thing that I am uh, also looking at, too, where with generating that additional revenue, this would actually allow local units government to to capture the circuit breaker losses that they've had in the past. So I would be replacing the circuit breaker losses, but then after that it would be uh, they could only grow at the rate of inflation. Now explain the circuit breaker losses. Mm-hmm. Is that tax caps years ago? Or? Yeah, yeah, from the tax cap. So so on the property taxes, what, what they do is they set their rates. If the rate is above 1%, that's that's capped, that goes into a, into a circuit breaker loss. Um, so from a homeowner's perspective, so that is the, if the rate's above that 1%, uh, local units of government are going to see a circuit breaker loss on, on anybody that's under that 1% rate. On the two, if it's over 2%, mm-hmm. then they would see a circuit breaker loss for anybody that's above the 1% plus the 2%, plus another circuit breaker loss at the 2%, same for the 3%. So if you have a higher rate than the tax cap, that's where that circuit breaker comes into play. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. That's exciting. I think that's that would be huge. It w- we'd be the first in the nation. Nobody else really? is talking about this. No, no other state. No, no other state. Now, LG, you know, she, Susan, she's kind of, she's been up here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Love her to death, and she was talking about, you know, um, along the same kind of lines, getting rid of income tax, mm-hmm. which w- sounded great, you know. So it, it's really cool if. Um, Obviously, there's always going to be taxes. Absolutely. Uh, because we need money for roads. We need money for um, government, but uh, government entities. Um, so, but it is kind of exciting to hear when, when there is a cut. And, and that makes, you know, because that, that's going to spread it out a little mm-hmm. bit. Absolutely. Because not everyone owns yeah. a home, but everyone does go get that oil change absolutely so so yeah everyone pays services of some sort right Right. uh and and so what you're doing is you're you're broadening your taxing base across all citizens throughout the state plus Mm -hmm. non-citizens you're going to get tourists coming in to the state as well that's also going to purchase service type uh goods and and then all and then as well as illegal immigrants now what about we'll touch on that a little bit yeah um, what about utilities? So utilities are already taxed. Okay. So so any industry that's already taxed that would uh, that would not change. There wouldn't okay. be a new tax on top of that if they're already. That's where I was going with zero. that because I was like, well, let's you know we got ten utilities going on. But, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so they're, 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 you already pay a sales tax on utilities, and then mm-hmm. on the generating of utilities, the way that works in the back channels, they, there's a specific tax tied to the utilities within that so this would not put an additional tax on utilities okay i like it man i i, I just like it because it spreads it out mm-hmm. it spread it spreads out the expenditure it'll be a huge incentive for uh home buyers mm-hmm. especially first time home buyers i mean uh, everybody um, i mean you actually get to own your home after it's paid off i know because like now you know we talked about this at the picnic uh the government owns your home mm-hmm if you if you always have to pay on it, mm-hmm. yeah, you're you're the government basically running the ground, yeah, right. So, um, what's the chances you can pull this off? So, so I've got an uphill battle, just to be honest, um, and just from the fact that I am literally proposing to upset the apple cart on how we fund local units of government. Now, I will say, as I've as I've been out talking, I've talked to the Speaker of House, I've talked to our Ways and Means, uh, our Republican Caucus on uh-huh. Ways and Means. Everyone seems to be open to it. They're asking a lot of questions, and I think the biggest thing from all the different members in the General Assembly, as I as I talk to, they're 
anyone's hesitant to support a plan this big until they see how it's going to affect their community. And, and right. that's a fair point because if somebody came to me and said, okay, we're going to throw this taxing structure outside and restart right. with something else. The first question I'm, I'm going to have is how does this affect my community? <laughs> right. I want to see how, I want to see how the numbers work. So until they see it on paper, I think that is uh, going to be the turning point when I can start getting by. And now I do have some key members that I'm working with on this. Senator Alexander, he's he's uh, working mm-hmm. right alongside me on the on the Senate side. Um, Senator Gaskell's on board as well. I've got some other state reps up in the northeastern part of the state that, that's working with me on this. So we've got a small coalition, um, but uh, do you have any bipartisanship support? Uh, not yet. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, I haven't approached too many members on right. the minority side yet. Right. Right. But uh, I, I I anticipate that we will get some with this, but you never know in politics. I mean, and you don't know. You absolutely do not know in politics. Um, I think, so what would would this be like a light switch comes on, light switch goes off at, on the same day? No. It, so here, here's the way it would work. So starting in uh, so th- say I'm just making the assumption, right, right, right. assumption, say this passes in 2025, mm-hmm. uh, this next um, general assembly session on upon passage, no new TIF districts can be created. That's key because we wouldn't want communities mm-hmm. going out and starting a bunch of TIF districts as they're getting ready to go away. Uh, then calendar year 2025 would be the last year of assessments, property tax assessments. Mm-hmm. And then that, those would be payable in 26. So tw- so 26, calendar year 26, would be the last year of property taxes payable. So it'd be the last year you pay property taxes. Then in, also in 2026, we would start collecting sales tax on services on July 1. Okay. So, so there would be six months where you're paying both property taxes and sales right. tax on services, but really you're paying the previous year's property taxes. Right. And then on uh, 2027, on, July, or on January 1st, that's when we would start um, sending out the funds from the from the sales tax revenue to local units of government. So starting January 1st of 2027, that's when local units of government would be relying on sales tax on services to fund uh, local government operations. Man, that's wild. Mm-hmm. So, an in- okay, so obviously, you know, you know me very well. You know how my brain works. I'm like, ding, 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 squirrel. Hey, coffee. Yeah. But, um, and there's a lot of details to this. So, so there's, <laughs> there's a lot coming at I you. I know. Um, I love it. Especially if we can come out ahead mm-hmm. because, so explain this to me, educate me on this on a local city government. Where does their general fund come from? So their general fund mainly comes from property taxes. You've also got a local option income tax that it could go into as well, or that could fund that as well. But but it's a combination of uh, property tax and local option income tax. So that would switch Mm -hmm. over to sales tax on services. And would that be sales tax on services in their city? No. So it would not work if you did it if you're collecting it locally, it's got to be all go be collected statewide and then distributed back out. Okay. Uh, and, and the reason being, look at how many small rural communities don't have necessarily the service base in their community, but like in Randolph County, for example, there's a lot of times where I'll be coming down and hiring a service out of Richmond or hi- have, hiring a service out of okay. Muncie, okay. but yet I'm still paying in. Right. So, mm-hmm. uh, so that's why it has to be collected statewide and then, then distributed it's- back out. And what this does is now it makes from an economic development perspective, which is a whole other discussion we're going to have at the state house, the, mm-hmm. the future of IEDC and economic development. But um, what, it, what it does is it forces Indiana economic development to look at everything from a statewide approach versus a regional approach, because now it behooves Wayne County for Blackford County to do well. It's good for randolph county if marion county does well because we're all in this boat together right because it's all it's all generating revenue statewide okay so what what's the so going to uh edc Mm -hmm. well we'd still need 92 counties of them to i think that's a discussion that's worth having 
with or without this bill, to be honest with you. Um, but but I think that's mainly a local local level. So now it would change their tools, right? Because mainly mm-hmm. what local economic developments do is give out tax abatements. Well, there's no tax abatements because everybody's abated at this point. There's no property taxes, period. Uh, if this passes. If this passes, right? right. So, and, and also business personal property taxes. I don't know if I said that earlier. I'm also repealing business personal property taxes as well. So no tax on equipment either. Um so, so that does hold on. I'm gonna order some iPads. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I need 20 more iPads. Um, but uh, so, so yes, yeah, so that kind of takes away an incentive that economic development has. I don't necessarily say that it goes away, but I think oh, yeah. it would be restructured. There'd be different tools, and and really, economic development at that point within a county, it's going to be it'd be funded directly out of the general fund operations. There might there might be different incentives and mm-hmm. things they can do, um, but really, if you look at economic development offices, especially at the county level. Mm-hmm. When when they got started, there was a handful of them that really went out there and around the state and really brought in businesses. One now, was right before you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That man. Yep, he, he really Beimer. worked it. Yeah, he, he worked it and uh, he did a great job yeah. in Randolph County. Um, but now all 92 counties has their own economic development office. Mm-hmm. We've got the state economic development office and it's, it comes down to the philosophical question of how much should the government be getting involved in these in these business deals, and are we are we bringing in jobs? Or are we just trading from one area to another and passing them mm-hmm. back and forth? Are we really doing any any good with them? Right. Um, and I think that's a that's a genuine debate and a, that we can look into. And I, I honestly don't know the answer to that completely without looking. And I think it's and I think it depends on the community you're in and what they're doing. Um, so I think the role of economic development is going to change over the years. There might, if you're if you continue to do the same thing, you get behind, you get complacent. Right. So you constantly have to be evolving. So I don't I don't want. I'm not saying that we need to get rid of all economic development. Absolutely. I'm saying I'm saying we need to restructure it and think differently and, and think of new ways to bring in business. And I think this is a way that bring in business. Because can you imagine from the business community's perspective to go to a state they don't have to and not have any pro- real property or business personal property tax. Well, and that's, that's the, I, I don't know. I just see that as the number one um, challenge of an entrepreneur, um, whether it's a solopreneur or it's a CEO with a, you know, a team of 300 mm-hmm. is taxes. Yep. Well, and you pay property taxes, whether you make money or not, it's due every year. <laughs> Income taxes, it's based on, it's based on exactly. the revenue you bring in. This one is the one tax that uh, you pay, whether you make money or not. Exactly. Even with a sales tax, you can only pay sales tax if you have money to, to pay for the good, pay for the service. Right. right. So right. if you're making less money, you're going to pay for less services and goods. So that's, so it makes it a more fair tax. I think it's pretty exciting and kind of going back to, um, I know Susan talked about, you know, um, you know, she was talking about there was a, mm-hmm. there's a lot of state agencies that don't really need to exist. I agree. And I see this. So, you know, I was a city employee for Richmond Fire mm-hmm. Department, and I seen this um, as a catastrophe at the bottom because it's all of these general fund, not all of them, all a lot of these general funds are so underfunded. Mm-hmm to where a lot of public safety entities are understaffed. Mm -hmm. So not only are we providing less than adequate services at the, you know, at the Mm -hmm. bottom on city government, um, we're also overtaxing these people, the the human beings in these positions. And that's why I'm kind of like, when I see this, I'm like 7%, go 14. And then, increase these general funds. Uh, so, well, there's there's actually a way to help out with public safety without increasing the 7%. So there's, there's another aspect detail. to this. Yeah. So so right now, there's an option for local units of government to take one and a quarter percent and add it onto their lit tax, their local option income tax. So you can have an additional one and a quarter percent that is supposed to be for property tax relief. So they can use that local option income tax to lower their property tax rates to give more, to, to spread that out to mm-hmm. basically shift that tax burden from property tax to income tax. So if there's no property taxes, there's no reason to have that extra one and a quarter percent of local option income tax, right? Because it's not 
going to property okay. tax relief because there's no property taxes. So what I am, this is not in the bill yet, but it's something I am proposed. I am uh, working on, on on exactly how I want to do it. But um, what I'm looking at doing is taking that one and a quarter percent and allowing part of that to be used for uh, for public safety, police, fire, EMS, right. to to allow them to keep that one and a quarter percent as a local option income tax. So I'd probably take one percent of that and put it towards police, fire, and EMS, and have that quarter percent left over and allow that as an extra um, option for for schools mm-hmm. for for additional school funding if a county would want to do that because the schools are not, are losing their referendum ability, mm-hmm. um, which I'd make the argument that the schools have enough margin to operate within budget within the budgets they have and don't need that referendum ability. But that is a something that I have in my back pocket as a as a negotiating okay. piece. To be honest, right? You always have to have plan A, yeah, B, C, A point B. Right, right. Um, so that could be broken down a little. I mean, there's different ways you can do it, but that is one way you could direct specific funds uh, to to boost public safety okay. dollars. Okay. Because um, I see it, I see it, uh, you know, on, on the on the very bottom, mm-hmm. on the local level, um, where they're kind of forced to do things for profit mm-hmm. uh, on one side of the street. Yeah, like the fish fries or the other things that well, they're trying that, to, oh, yeah, like, they're like to raise money. The, the EMS services oh, yeah. I'm with sorry, the yeah. fire has yeah. to go out and make a bunch of money yeah. to sustain the fire trucks. Yep not really the ambulances. So, um, and they've had to do that. Um, I know, um, Union city kind of did that first where then they started taking salaries out of that non reverting fund because it wasn't part of their general fund. It wasn't part of their, Mm -hmm. and and then now I think Winchester's doing that. Yeah, they are. A lot of communities are starting to do that. I know. Um, so it's kind of like, well, how can we like, does Indiana really need 92 courthouses, 92 county? <laughs> like, is there some consolidation that can be done to kind of alleviate some of this? Yeah, and think one area that always comes up is township governments, whether that could be combined or, or not. And and to be fair, I've always been to the aspect I always want to keep township governments um, mm-hmm. because they they know the people in the area, especially when you're talking about poor relief, when you're talking about the, the fire departments, volunteer mm-hmm. fire departments, it's kind of the identity. Um, the, there are some areas where uh, there's been some abuse, though, in other parts of the state. Um, so it's, it's what's expenditure. Yeah. Yeah. Some expenditures. Some some oh, yeah. Whoa. oh yeah. There's so, so that is one thing that if, if we're going to keep township governments, we need to make sure that everybody's right. operating the way they should be. Right. Um, Bro. Did you see that? The sheriff that was, uh, on six, you know, the 60 days in on a and E that television show. Yeah. The one down in Southern Indiana. Yeah. That's crazy. Isn't it? And that was all the township money. Yeah, it was township money, county money. Um, and I don't know all the details of the case, but I, I know enough to know that he, he did a lot of inappropriate things. And I, I uh, honestly am not sure how he's the only one that's gotten wrapped up on. I don't see how somebody could pull that much fraud off over that long a period of time and nobody else caught on. Uh, it so it, it took down his of, wife. It took down his daughter, him. Um, it, I, I bet, man that there's more connections. Well, he was really close friends with our governor. Or current? Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. Uh, he was in he was in state party for a while. I, I don't know. It's just I there's it's just a weird It's wild, bro. Yeah, I don't know. There's just a you pull back the curtain. And I'm not saying people. governor has anything to do with right, it. I'm not right. saying that. I'm but just he saying was, I'm, but he was well connected is what I'm getting at. Those are the people you got to watch sometimes. Yeah. So so I don't know. It's um those those are the type of people I try to steer clear of. You know? I know you'll end up on Netflix series. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's going to be a Netflix series. Oh, I'm sure it will be. I mean, or some some sort of series like that, right? Whether it be Netflix or Hulu or that's, one of them, right? Yeah, that was crazy. Um, with, a lot of crazy things have happened. Oh lately. yeah, it's wild. But there was a township trustee. This was a Democrat up in Adams County that just got. Uh, busted for for embezzling funds as well. So that's what I'm talking really? about. That um, with the with the township governments, it's they're great when they work good. And I think in a lot of 
a lot of our area, mm-hmm. they do work really good. So, so you want to protect that. But at the same point, we cannot allow for a system that where there's been multiple abuse in different right. parts of the state time and time again. So I think that's one of the things that have to be, have right. to be looked at. Well, cause if money goes missing, then these taxes just have to increase. Mm-hmm. Exactly. To make up for it. Exactly. You know, um, that's really exciting. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm excited. What's the next step? So this is house bill 33. Uh, so th- there's not a bill number or, yet on this. Oh, okay. so so I'm Age in the 30. I'm in the early stages now. So what I'm doing is I'm still in the process of drafting the bill, finalizing the the details of it. But since this is such a big proposal, right. I'm trying to get out and talk that about right. it early and, and build support I mean, for it. The way you explained it, um, I think it'd be huge because it spreads it out a little more, um, and it's not going to add an extra tax to something that's already being taxed, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, I don't know what percent, what, uh, you, do you know the percentage of people who rent versus homeowners? I don't off the top of my head. I can pull that number up, but I don't off the top of my head. Um, so that's just, that's but another renters thing. pay as well and property taxes and they pay at a higher rate than homeowners. So, so renters, Oh yeah. Because, I didn't know that. Yeah. Cause, uh, landlords pay a 2%. They're in the 2% property tax caps. So they pay oh. the 2% rate versus the 1% rate. You know the landlords aren't eating that out of their own pocket. They're right. passing that on in their oh, rent. I know. So this is actually so the property tax system actually charges renters more than it does homeowners. True. And especially when you take uh, and they don't have and those homes don't have any of the deductions on them either. Like you've got your standardized homestead deduction. If you've got the sixty-five and older deduction. If you've got mm-hmm. your um, military deductions. Your your uh, geothermal deduction. I mean, there's all kinds of deductions that are available for homeowners' property mm-hmm. that is not eligible for those those rental properties. Man, I'm just thinking about a couple of my buddies. Um, I have some really wealthy friends. Mm-hmm. I almost feel like they write me off on their taxes as like their <laughs> charity work. I've no, I know some of those too. I've got <laughs> some know, too. <laughs> right? Like, why are you hanging out with me? <laughs> why are you letting me come around? I think I'm like charity worker, um, but. You know, they have, um, gosh, one of them probably has 50 uh, uh, properties, Mm -hmm. rental properties throughout Richmond. Um, Well, into Cincinnati and everywhere else, but I'm just thinking like, whoa. But but you know he's passing on that that uh, increase uh, on yeah. to the landlord, right? I mean, oh, any yeah. business person, will, I, you have to. I mean, we we stay we've on got top. It's what we do. I know. Well, I have a so I live and own. Um, or a new res mortgage owns it really, but a three bedroom on a slab, mm-hmm. nice place on the west side. That's you know I pay like a four hundred for mortgage, mm-hmm. and that's escrow insurance mm-hmm. tax everything right. four hundred. But if I was to rent it out, everyone's like oh eight nine hundred dollars mm-hmm. to rent it out. But your taxes are going to go up too because then you lose your homestead on it. It'd be yeah, uh, yeah. It's wild. It's wild what what it what that would do. Mm-hmm. Um. So I was, so I looked around, I was looking at some other stuff and I found this survey, a 2024 survey. So were these, so is this like, um, a survey that you did amongst? Yeah. So that survey, so each year, each before session, we do legislative surveys and, uh, the way the process works on the surveys, um, it's each caucus does one. So the Democrats, all the members do one. Our, all, all of us Republican members do one. We've get, uh, so our caucus, we, we have a list of, I don't know, 85 to a hundred questions that we can choose from. And so I go through the, the list of survey questions and I pick the ones that I think are uh, pertinent to the district or the session that's coming forward. Um, on the short session ones, I try and pick ones that I think may be both pertinent that year plus right. the following year because by the time Hot we get topics. in and get this get the survey data back, we're kind of late into session already. So I try and pick something that um, can kind of give me some guidance, not not just for that session but moving mm-hmm. forward as well. Uh, and then in the long session, we we get them back a little bit sooner. Um, but it's not just the questions. Uh, I, I actually get. I mean, the survey questions itself, those questions that are on there, that data is important to kind of give me a pulse of where the district is. It's non-scientific. It's just whoever right. whoever turns them back in. But um, 
But just as important to the answers on those questions there are all the comments that come back. So I get, uh, I leave a comment All section. the like, why? Yeah. You know, like, uh, it's, I love it. Uh, all of them, you know, um, against straight ticket voting. That's, that's always been huge. Because mm-hmm. I think that if you, if you can fully, if you vote straight ticket every time without knowing who you're voting for and knowing, like, Man, because I've I've seen on a local level, I've seen someone flip Democrat mm-hmm. to Republican to Democrat, mm-hmm. like in three years. Oh, it so it's like it, time, it's yeah. like you need to know what that person is actually, what their beliefs are, what they're wanting right. to do. Um, well, and then the other th- thing with straight ticket voting, your county council at large seats where you pick yeah. two out of three, or yeah. pick, I mean, depending on it doesn't the, even pick just, those, right? It doesn't pick those, so you have to. So even if you vote straight ticket you have to go back down and select those individually or school board races, which are still technically nonpartisan, even though we all know they're partisan. Right. People all, all, everyone has a political viewpoint. So, uh, but, um, so those seats as well, you have to go down and individually select those. So there's a lot of voters that don't realize they think they voted. Mm-hmm. They voted straight ticket. They think that's all they need to do. They don't, they didn't realize they, they didn't vote for the county council members or the school board races. <laughs> So, so yeah, <laughs> read your so, ticket. So they're, they're all undervoted. So, uh, I mean, I pretty much vote straight ticket Republican, but I go through and check each box. Make sure I want to <laughs> see, make sure Kevin Shook didn't slide yeah. in as president. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. But, uh, one of them, you know, uh, first responders administering drugs like Narcan, mm-hmm. um, should these patients be uh, involuntarily committed to certified addiction treatment program? Uh, absolutely. You know, um, I've seen it for 10 million yep. many times. And then uh, I've had family that many times could have used it. Mm-hmm. Um, myself, I could have used it with alcohol, but um, so what were some of the comments on that? Did you, were they, because people, have, a lot of, you'll have people um, talk about them, them damn druggies and all that stuff, but the, and not understand, not be empathetic and understand addictions and stuff. But yeah, so I'm not having any comments that are jumping out to mind on that one specifically really? off the top of my head, except for the fact that they they pointed to relatives and stuff that they knew. Right. Would be just similar stories like that. Um, but uh, that I mean that was the gist of the comments on that one specifically. Uh, we did have um, a regional mental health facility that we're that we're starting in Delaware County. It's going to be the first one, and it'll nice. cover Wayne County as now, well. Who's that through, or can you talk about it, that? It's actually with the county and the state is starting it, and it's really um, yes, yeah, so it's going out at the at the Delaware County Justice Center. It's it's not it's on the same campus, but it's a separate building, so it's so it's separate you're not from, in jail. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's separate from the Justice Center, okay. but it's on that same campus. Um, so it's a county facility that state is, uh, um, it was one of the funds that we had in this last state budget was for these regional mental health facilities. And the first one that got awarded is our region. Wayne County is actually included in that. So it'll benefit Wayne County as well, even though it's not here. Um, and so we did, I did have some comments on that specifically because that was being established. And so I had some people thanking us for, for getting that through and approved. So that was, that was a few of the comments that that we had and that was just uh and that that broke ground about a month ago so so yeah the groundbreaking started on that construction's underway um mm-hmm. so i'm looking forward to a to a ribbon cutting coming up soon that'll right. be exciting yeah let me know when that happens yeah we'll do I'll, i'd love to come up there and, and we we really hope that this could be modeled around the state in different regions around right. the state so that that's the plan and so that, so it's starting off with uh i think 20 something beds on each side, um, and rooms, but then there's actually the ability for it to be added on to and expanded as well. If it, if it, if it's successful. And so do you know the process yet on intake? I, I do not yet. They're still setting up those. I know they've got a plan and a process, but on the day to day details, I have not, uh, been involved to that extent. I mean, it, just the general concept is I'm, I'm working on it at a high level overview, helping them secure those state funds and get that. The locals right. are actually running it from from the from that standpoint forward. And I ask that because we have, you know, um, like in Richmond, we have the state hospital. Mm-hmm. 
And then we have a, um, which is, well, they do, I, Meridian used to have an addiction center out there, but um, you would have to jump through like 13 hoops before you could become a patient. So somebody couldn't just be taken there right? by ambulance or just taken there by POV or so that's that's always been the problem, and mm-hmm. that's where that we usually, um, where usually people usually fall off. Yeah. So like we would transport from the street an overdose, mm-hmm. and um, get them to the hospital, mm-hmm. and then a lot of times they'll sign out mm-hmm. before we even get done with our right. report. So. In the the hospital is not going to do anything. Yeah. They're going to tell you like. Oh, there's a treatment center in Indianapolis or something like that. They're not going. They're, they're not going to do anything. Yeah. So, so with this one, it's not part of this facility, but it's in collaboration. So the city of Muncie is also work is also developing a one day. It's just a 24 hour treatment mm-hmm. facility. Um, and and from the collaboration standpoint, is they can uh, those that meet the criteria to get admitted for that long term treatment and care for the mental health, for the regional mental health facility. Um, I, th- I think they're working on it. I know they're working on a process as to how to uh, utilize that, that, that quick term, that short term treatment, the 24 hour hold that Muncie has uh-huh. in their facility. Cause it, it's, it's geared towards just the 24 hours, but how to properly vet and roll those over into uh, who, who meets the right criteria mm-hmm. and can fit into that into that long-term mental health. And it, it'll be another shift, like mm-hmm. kind of your tax shift. It'll be another shift in a way because, you know, in that, in that um, survey they talked about, you know, um, because it costs so much to provide mm-hmm. that Narcan. But now if it's involuntarily, the staff, the nursing staff, the mm-hmm. facility, all that will have to be funded. Yep, absolutely. So, um, no, that was pretty cool. And I know I sent you a message that kind of ties in Mm -hmm. to the mobile graded, mobile integrated health. Yep. Um, I sent you the 1385 house bill, um, that Brad Barrett just signed. And, uh, I try to make sense of it. Um, cause it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And I didn't know if, if now I know, um, you know, I think every state representative has their own little niche. Oh yeah, and he, absolutely. He, he's a physician, so healthcare is yep. always going to be his niche. Yep. But I want I wanted to see what your take was on it. Yeah. So I mean, the the intent of that bill was to stop surprise billing on ambulance services. It was at least part one of the aspects of it. So it capped the. Um, the rate that could be charged to 400%. I had to refer back to my notes. Yeah, here that's fine, I'm, bro. I'm not, uh, <laughs> this, uh, topic, I know enough to be dangerous about to yeah, be honest with yeah. you. It's not my area of expertise. So I, I trust guys like Brad and others yeah. that are in the industry. He said it and he was going to join us, but yeah, he, I guess he's, it's hard time where he's at. Uh, but that, that was the, what was the main part. And then also there was a provision to, um, make sure that local EMS or, or, or the EMS services are being paid on a timely manner by Medicaid, Medicare mm-hmm. on those government payments coming back. Um, so that is supposed to get paid within 30 days now. So those are the two primary factors that was in that bill was, was to try and help with that surprise billing mm-hmm. perspective from the out of network billing. Um, is what was happening when you have a car wreck, you don't get it. You don't have an out option to ask. Is this a in network ambulance? Is this <laughs> yeah. an out of network ambulance? <laughs> Just get me to the hospital, right? right? right. <laughs> if you're bleeding out, you don't care. Just get me there. Right. Well, what what was happening in some cases? Providers were charging extremely high uh, rates for out of network ambulance services. That was just not fair to to people. To be quite quite frank, to where um, so, so that was part of trying to rein that in a little bit. Okay. So the, the ambulance service not charging as much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so it still allows, uh, so the it cap the rate at 400% of the published rate for the ambulance service. Um, so whatever the in network rate was, mm-hmm. it could, the out of network rate could be 400% the in network rate. That's still quite a bit higher. Whoa. Right. So yeah. they were, there were some charging more than that. Um, at least that's the way I understand it. So, so it at least limits it. It's wild because we already pay tax. Yeah. 
to have those services provided. Yeah. So, but but I'd ask I'd ask Doc Barrett on a little I more know. detail. I, tr- I tried to give him a call on the, on the way in, but I think he's on vacation. So, well, it's wild because I mean, for one, he mentioned mobile integrated health, which yeah. has nothing to do with an ambulance. Mm-hmm. Um, mobile gr- integrated, and when he signed it, he had the Richmond Fire Department in the background when mm-hmm. he did the signature, which didn't make sense because their their MIH program just went. Pew. Yep. Um, MIH is huge. It needs to be everywhere, not ran by fire departments because mm-hmm. they don't understand right. it. Um, so, you know, my last position was a county service, Putnam County, and they were the first county, um, I do believe the first county in the state that actually, if you're a county resident of Putnam County, your insurance, your Medicaid, your Medicare, all of that's going to be billed. Mm-hmm. You're not. Mm-hmm. So the rest gets written off. Yeah. And if you don't have any of that insurance, you yep. still don't get a bill yep. because they've seen it as you pay taxes yep. for this already. Yep. Um, where we're at when we come to fire department agencies, mm-hmm. we're trying to make money. We see EMS as extra money mm-hmm. source, not emergency medical services. So that's where this bill, all this yeah. billing issue comes because we're trying to make that money yep. to pay for firemen, yep. to pay for... Fire trucks, fire yep. stations, it, and and I think I may have misspoke. I said four hundred percent of the out of, of the in network rate. I think it's four hundred percent of the Medicare Medicaid rate. Uh, I got it right at the four hundred percent a published rate for ambulance services established under the Medicare law. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah. So it was that not not Medicare. the so it'd be lower than than the right. than the in network rate, or it's to be it wouldn't be lower than the in-network rate, but it'd be lower than 400% the in-network rate. It'd be 400% the medic- Medicaid rate. And when I was closer to this, I seen, uh, I felt like every year, Medicare and Medicaid tried to do stuff to get out of paying. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. They do. Like, okay, here's my <laughs> Saturday. Mm-hmm. I'm, so I'm not employed. I'm mm-hmm. still licensed as a paramedic. Mm-hmm. Not employed. But... So I'm just a bystander that got this dude's pulse back. Mm-hmm. I got more praise, right? Now, if I was an employee, the first thing they're going to say is, "Did you get signatures?" Mm-hmm. And that's a Medicaid. That's are you? That's why there's so well between that and then EMTs and paramedics make a fraction of what firemen make mm-hmm. when it's not fire based. You know, right? Um, on top of you just saved a life. The first thing you hear is, did you get signatures yeah, right. from your boss? You know, <laughs> so it's a very poor morale, but Medicare and Medicaid has been huge on that, on everything. Like you got to make sure your eyes are right. dotted, your T's are crossed and your signature. Yep. And, um, so it's like an ongoing joke in EMS. Like, dude, you, uh, you could save, 30 babies from a house fire, but yep. the first thing they're going to ask you is, did you get signatures? Well, and, <laughs> and yeah, and that's, that's not what we want either. And, but the, the, and, and with Medicaid, Medicare, it's, it's a double edged sword because we need to make sure that the providers are getting paid adequately for the services and can take care and make right. sure we take care of employees. But we also have this growing Medicaid expense that's now eating up 18% of the state budget and growing rapidly. Because everyone can get on Medicaid. Yeah, exa- well, and that's, so I have been the lone Nova, Novo <laughs> uh, numerous times on expanding Medicaid access on for different services and what services mm-hmm. are covered. And Like you've been against it? Or yeah, I voted, right. ag- I voted no. I voted against expanding right. the eligibility. And, uh, and reason being twofold, one, ev- Seems like you can get there, out for it, anything now, right? right? That, and, and yeah, that's why more people sit at home. I, exactly. So, so the the government handouts again are the entitlement program. So I'm against expanding those, but also I've seen this growing problem coming with Medicaid funding. Everybody is just scratching their head, wondering how do we get here with it eating up 18 percent of the budget, but yet we keep expanding it a little bit at a time year over year. It's like, what do you expect if we keep expanding right. it? You, you got to expect to have a budget crisis at some point. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you get passes it out, but yet if you're the no vote on that, right. you tell, well, you voted against, uh, 
Aunt Sally down the street because she needed those services. Well, no, no, it's not against that individual situation. I voted just, against Aunt Sally's son living in her basement because he can get Medicaid right. easy. <laughs> but you know how politics are. There's, there's always uh-huh. the negative mailers, right? There's they always the to. negative attacks. It's it's you you've and you could say that with any vote. I mean, if anybody that has a voting record, you could find a negative mailer to run against them because it's all about perspective and how you how you look at each individual situation and how you I mean, people take things out of context all the time. Okay. But when you look at big picture, we cannot continue down the path we're on. We've got to rein the spending and and but at the same point, make it to where those that are part of the program, those eligible service that do need to stay part of the program, Has those reimbursement rates are are high enough to where right. that option's available. Because right. if, if you don't, if you're not reimbursing at a high enough amount on one hand, you're not going to have enough providers to that are being or that are willing to go through the bureaucracy to to have the service. Right. Like why why go to nursing school to become a right. nurse? Exactly. If, if you know you can't. So be. it's a balance, right? Mm-hmm. That's wild. Um, so, so yeah, so my perspective is I want to help those that need the help, but uh, we have got way too many people in, in, the, in our state and in the country that are part of the entitlement program that need to get off their butt and get to work. Yeah, that's, and that's the big thing too. You know, you, know, um, you hear, you, you see job postings and you hear no one wants to work. And um, well, it's, it's almost easier to not work. And then some, some of what, these employers are paying, um, you know, like a single mother, Mm -hmm. she prefers to stay home Mm -hmm. and babysit her own kids versus paying for babysitting and then going to work for 14, 15 an hour. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's just so many dynamics to this structure that um, pay structure, employment opportunities, that type of stuff. Um, But you're right. It's like, man, some of these people... Yeah, and you can't do the Willy Wonka and wait for the golden ticket. Right, right, exactly. Although, chocolate does sound good. <laughs> <laughs> Sugar-free chocolate latte at Roscoe's, iced. Just keep that in mind. All right. <laughs> um, anything else you want to add? I mean, the property tax repeal replacement plan. Um, when does this go for vote or? So I'm planning on introducing it in, the, in January for the legislative session. So I, I do plan on once I get all the details and the numbers back from LSA, I plan on releasing it to the public well before session so people can have a chance to, to view it. So um, be on the lookout for a bill number sometime between organization day, which is November 19th and the, um, the end of this year. So before January 1st. Uh, somewhere in that range, there will be a bill number out where people could follow it, see the uh, fiscal analysis on it as mm-hmm. well, um, and have a complete breakdown and, and know how that's going to affect your community. So in the meantime, um, I'm asking for feedback. So if, any, if you can think of a problem with what I've thrown mm-hmm. out there, because I mean, right now I'm still working through the bill. So if, there, if you think of a problem, I can, I can tweak and fix things. And it's a lot easier to do that during the drafting stages and once it's filed. So uh, I'd, I'd ask for feedback at h33 at iga.in.gov. Okay. And I'll put that on the screen. Yep, so. absolutely. You That's probably leave exciting. a link in the description. Oh, maybe yeah. Too or something. Link yeah. in the bio. Like, share, follow. Um, yeah, that's... You get this passed. You're right up there with the... You'll be the next presidential debate. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know about that, but th- this is a big deal. If we can get this one across the finish line, it is a big deal. We'd be the first state in the nation to to completely eliminate property taxes. So let me go back. TIF, TIF yes. districts. Explain the TIF districts. Yes, absolutely. So so TIF districts are tax and increment finance districts, and there's different areas. It could be for housing, development. Um, what that is is you've, you've taken an area, a certain segment, and you've bonded the infrastructure and the property tax revenue coming back from that's generated in that in mm-hmm. that TIF district goes specifically towards paying off the infrastructure and the debt to get that that area created. So that is revenue that does not go back into the county's general operating fund. So it takes money away from other units of government right. within that within that area. Um, so what I'm doing is. Uh, 
no new TIF districts could be created after pa- upon passage of the bill. Any existing TIF district, we would we have to pay the bonding obligation. So out of this fund, all TIF districts would all the debt obligations would be paid out of the revenue generated on sales tax until that until the bonding obligations are all paid off. Once that debt is completely paid off, then um, that TIF, TIF, TIF district is dissolved. There's no more TIF district. And, and, there, and then those, that revenue that was going to fund the TIF to pay off those bond obligations would then go back into the pot to be split up between the, between the counties, the cities, local units, government. So, so that would get that money that was going towards those debt obligations. Mm-hmm. It would get it back into um, government services across the board. I like it. And down here they're talking about moving it into like residential development and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's like, residential TIFs as well, yeah. And, and the, the, the concept is the reason to do a TIF under the current taxing structure mm-hmm. is if there's no development there, it's a tax base It's not. Th- so the existing... I, this is an important point. So if it's say it's a farm field, mm-hmm. that you're going to turn into a TIF area and bring in housing. The the um, tax base that was already there from the agri- at the agriculture rate right. that would still go towards local units of government. It's the extra anything extra above that would go to fund the infrastructure with TIF. So so you'd have more houses. You'd have so you, so the the thought process is let's bring in development and growth. Let's pay for that development and growth through this TIF. And then once that TIF is done, if, if a TIF is done properly, once that is dissolved, then you've got that, that extra tax base go- supporting the community as a whole. The problem with TIF districts is you've got a lot of communities that will create a TIF district. They'll get close to paying that bond off. And then they'll go do another bond or do another project within that to keep that rate captured to keep that higher rate captured so they keep revolving it or they layer them on top of each other so there's too many tiff districts out there so it is an effective tool if used properly the problem is like anything else uh too many people tried to figure out how to game the system wow dun 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 Ah, i love it man i love it well thanks for coming up here yeah no problem uh, anytime educating me and then um couple people will probably watch this and they'll get some education so uh, this is really exciting um i can't wait to tell all my wealthy friends that own a lot of stuff yeah that's great <laughs> yeah they, sh- they should love it i most people around the state should like this plan it's going to oh uh, yeah and, and not yeah. just wealthy people yeah <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna help everybody let me back up before yeah. we get canceled by <laughs> but um yeah no everyone's gonna benefit from it and we need it um Man, we need it. Uh, hmm. Well, thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. And Appreciate now, it. Uh, Roscoe's Coffee. Yeah, sounds good to me. Life Inscripted with Kevin Shipp.